My name is Hans van der Quast. In this video I'm going to explain you the basics of surface energy balance modeling using remote sensing. After this lecture you will be able to describe the principles of surface energy balance models, describe the difference between single and dual source models, explain what remote sensing and meteorological input data is needed for surface energy balance modeling, and finally explain the results of surface energy balance models. Remote sensing based surface energy balance models model the partitioning of the net radiation in the soil heat flux, sensible heat flux and latent heat flux. These models are useful to estimate evapotranspiration over large areas with a limited need of ground data. Most of these models calculate the net radiation, soil heat flux and sensible heat flux separately and then the latent heat flux is often estimated as the rest term to close the energy balance. In these models, the sensible heat flux is often described as a physically based resistance network of energy exchanges between bare soil and vegetation and their exchange with the surrounding air. However, different models derive fluxes in a different way. In the next slides we will focus on the difference between single and dual source models. Surface energy balance models need to model the partitioning of the net radiation depending on the exhalation of water through the stomata of vegetation, which causes the transpiration, evaporation from bare soil, and evaporation from open water bodies. Single source models simplify this by using effective parameters for both canopy and bare soil, and therefore general data can be used. Examples of these models are CBAL, SEPS, or METRIC. Dual source models, however, parameterize the fluxes separately for the canopy and for bare soil. The two sources are then aggregated to derive the fluxes for the whole pixel. So dual source models have specific parameters for canopy and bare soil, and therefore they need more ancillary data than single source models. However, they can have a better physical realism. An example of a dual source model is the TSEP model. Now you might think, that we should always use dual source models because they have a more precise physical representation of the system. However, a lot of data that you need for these models is not available or not accurately obtained. Therefore we can say that a simple but correctly calibrated single source model might well perform better than an ill-parameterized dual source model. The most popular models are single source models. Remote sensing based surface energy balance models need a lot of input data derived from remote sensing. It's very common that these models need the land surface temperature or kinetic temperature, the broadband surface albedo, the emissivity and the incoming solar radiation. It depends on the sensor or the product that is available from the sensors what workflow you follow. On the slide you see two examples. On the left side you see a workflow for processing a raw Landsat thematic mapper image. It involves atmospheric correction, conversions and calculations of uh, NDVI. On the right side, you see the workflow for MODIS. In this case, we use readily available products. That saves a lot of time, but these products are also often more general. Some models include the pre-processing steps, while others keep that outside of the model. Besides remote sensing data, also meteorological data is needed as an input for these models. Most of these models need air temperature, air pressure, specific humidity, wind speed and the incoming solar radiation. This can be measured at a meteorological station in the area of interest or derived from global models such as GLDAS, ERA5, MERA2 and others. After all the input data has been prepared, we can run the model. After running the model, it's important to always check the results. Check if the results are as expected, if the values are within the physical boundaries and if the value ranges make sense. In the pictures of the slide you see the net radiation, which has a longer range than the other fluxes. The soil heat flux has the shortest range. The sensible heat flux can also be negative, because of the oasis effect explained in the previous video. The latent heat flux shows the inverse of the sensible heat flux for the irrigated pivots. There are some other considerations while using these models. Different models produce different output variables, so always check which ones you need. 
And in scripts, you can also turn on and off the ones that need to be uh, an output. The performance of these models differs with the local context. There's not one model that performs well under all uh, climatic zones and with all crops. So you need to check what works best in your case. Also, these models from remote sensing uh, produce instantaneous results for evapotranspiration that needs to be scaled to daily, monthly or other timescales. This can be done in different ways. Often the evaporative fraction is assumed to be constant. Finally, validation of your model results with field measurements is challenging. First of all, there are not many field measurements commonly available. Secondly, your model produces uh, pixels, which are quite coarse compared to field measurements at uh, specific locations in the field. Also, methods to measure evapotranspiration can be uh, quite tricky and have their own uncertainty. In this lecture, you've learned the basic principles of remote sensing-based surface energy balance modeling. You've learned the difference between single and dual source models, and you've learned what input data from remote sensing and meteorological measurements are needed to run these models. You've also learned to interpret the results of surface energy balance models.